Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. 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 Everybody sounds so bright and cheerful and ready to go. Yes, no. We heard there were treats for us today, so. Uh, let, okay, so let me ask first. Does anyone have any Valentine date? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Say yes, ma'am. Okay, Lisa. Yes, yes, ma'am. You do? What time is that? No. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I told him he's got out at 8 30, ma'am. All right. Now, I'm not going to, I'll try not to keep you too late tonight. I know people have things to do. It's a special night. I appreciate you so much. So, I, I will not do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, not a problem. All right, so let's talk about, in chapter five, it's about mortgages, duties, liabilities, and rights. I mean, so one of the primary duty of a mortgage is to repay on the principal, the interest, and any other sums that are due. So if the mortgage or fails to repay, of course the mortgage has the right to pursue a number of legal remedies in light of the breach of contract of the terms of the mortgage agreement. So last week I assigned some cases and let's see who can summarize their cases starting with Darius, is he on? No. So, so Darius had one. Uh, let me see, is Gabrielle on? She had Sadiq. No. Ashley, you're on. Okay, Ashley. Tell us about Sylvan Properties. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um my case was the case between um, Sylvan Properties LTD versus Royal Bank of Scotland, 2004. Um, Sylvan Properties Limited and Chart Enterprise basically represented the appellants or the mortgagers and Royal Bank of Scotland and their two appointed receivers, Nigel Root and Timothy Harris represented the respondents or the mortgagees and the receivers. So the claimants, which would be Sylvan Properties and Chart Enterprise are property companies of the Ezekiel family who had borrowed a large sum of money from the Bank of Scotland. To secure this loan, um, multiple properties were mortgaged as collateral at some point following the terms of the mortgage agreement, the bank resorted to demanding repayment um, from Sylvan Properties, repayment of the loan. So hence they appointed two receivers um, to sell the mortgage properties for them. And the receivers did indeed sell all of the properties. And it was multiple properties, like about 34. Uh, the issue at hand though was that the mortgager, which would be Sylvan Properties, thought that um, the receivers had sold the properties at a cost that was too low. So Sylvan Properties had actually claimed damages against the bank as the mortgagee and the receivers by alleging that a breach of duty, that they had a breach of duty because they sold the mortgage properties at an undervalue so Sylvan Properties supported this claim by pointing out that the receiver sold the property um, seeking to increase without seeking, without first seeking to increase the value by obtaining planning permission for further development of the properties and without first resorting to leasing properties that were vacant. In both instances, uh, the bank would have been able to increase the, the sale price of these properties had they followed those. 
So Sylvan Properties went on to explain that the receivers did actually begin investigating the process for obtaining planning permissions in 1996, which would have allowed the properties to be enhanced and thus sold for a more increased price. However, in 1997, um, the receivers decided not to go through with obtaining planning permissions for the properties or leasing vacant properties for further revenue. Instead, the receivers just sold the properties as is with the profits going toward the bank loan. So um, earlier when I said that the Sylvan properties claim that the bank and receivers had a breach of duty when they sold the properties of all those when they sold the properties for those low prices, um, the judge had to actually begin outlining the duties of a mortgagee and a receiver in this case to uncover if there was actually a breach in duty. And so the judge ruled in favor of the bank and receivers, and he did that by explaining, well, I only gonna outline a few of the points and some of these actually, um, some of these actually connect with the points that we spoke about in model three, when we spoke about the appointment of receivers. And these are some of the points he outlined. Um, the mortgagee is entitled to, firstly, the mortgagee is entitled to sell the mortgage as is. He is under no obligation to increase the value before sale or delay a sale in order to achieve a higher price which was the misconception that Sylvan Properties had. They figured, okay, the Bank of Scotland owed them actually getting the highest price that they could get for these properties um, by first enhancing them or adding fixtures or whatever, but they didn't have to do that. They just had to sell as is, and that's what the Bank of Scotland did. Um, secondly, the mortgage, she has the right to investigate whether and how he can unlock the potential for an increase in value of property um, that was mortgaged by using application of planning permission or the grant of a lease. He has the right to, but he is free to also not take that route. And in this case, we saw where the Bank of Scotland, the receivers did not take that route. They just chose, chose to sell the property as is. And then finally, um, the judge, spoke to if the Sylvan properties wanted these kind of duties to be taken on by the bank, they should have put that in the, the first mortgage agreement, the actual mortgage agreement that they made as a protective provision. But they did not add um, those duties as a protective provision when they did their mortgage agreement. So hence the claimant's claim was dismissed by the judge for a second time, because this was the second time that um, this case was taken up by a judge. Okay. Anybody have any questions? That's a very good case. Ashley can share it um, with you, because she has the full document. And it's a very good case, because you see, as we also refer to not only just appointment of a receiver, but you also see it further down when you start to talk about the sale of the property or the power of sale. So that case can be applied to both. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a very important case and it's a very, a very good one for you to read, especially when you apply it in your exam. So that's a hint. Okay. Um, Kawami, is he on? Yes, he is. You are downside nominees. Uh, yes, I had downside nominees. Um, I couldn't find downside nominees, though. I found mm -hmm. da Downs View nominees limited. I, okay. What is I, it don't know if that, I don't know if that's the same thing. Is it on real property? Uh, yes, it's basically where it says to ch charge. Um, it's on, um, let's see. Uh, it, it is on um, receivers and appointed managers company. But is okay. is actually Downs View Normandy Limited versus oh, first versus yeah. first city corporation. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, basically, it, um, it's basically a. Uh, I think it started off where they said because I was unable to find the entire thing, 
they um, so I found um, the information on it, and they basically said that is the charge where the holder acted in bad faith and and liable and damages uh, um, subsequent charge to the holder. And they said the fact of the matter was that the plaintiff appointed receivers and managers of the company over over its in de its de de debenture, and a separate debenture in relation to the company was held by the defendants. The, and the defendants appointed the receivers and managers of the company for the purpose of disrupting the receivership. Um, for disrupting the receivership integrated by the first plaintiff under the defendant's receivership of the company. Um, they had an issue basically um, with two persons who was involved in it. And, you know, they was, ca they was causing issues between one another, uh, trying, trying to see exactly what was, how, um, how they could get, a get around it. And the issues arrived where they say damages were awarded in the first instance against the defendant in favor of the plaintiff's breach of his duty and negligence. And this is basically from the Court of Appeal um, in New Zealand, um, partially allowed an, ap an appeal by defendants, and there was no further appeal to the Judicial Committee or the Privy Council. Um, the appeal was dismissed, and the plaintiff's cross appeal was allowed. Um, the Privy Council held that the equity ex um, imposed a specific duty on the mortgagee, the first, uh, uh, basically the mortgagee of the first de defendant and the, and the receiver appointed by them to exercise their powers in good faith for the purpose of obtaining payment of charge. Uh, the equitable duty was owned to the borrower and to, the, to any subsequent charge or debenture holder. Um, the receivership by the defendants had been instigated for improper purpose. That's the receivership by the second defendant. Mm -hmm. And the first defendant acted in bad faith by failing to transfer the debenture to the first plaintiff uh, when the first requested to do so. Um, <laughs> according to the defendants were liable, um, the defendants were liable in damages to the same extent as would have been applicable had they been liable in negligence. Um, and I think they received um, the judgment in the case basically on downfield nominee versus the first city. Um, uh, it says that it said that it was held that the mortgagee owes no general duty in negligence, subsequent mortgage mortgagees or mortgagers to use reasonable care in exercise an exercise of their powers and dealing with the assets of the mortgager. However, equity imposed on the mortgagee and receiver and manager specific duties, including the duty uh, to exercise their powers in good faith mm -hmm. for the purpose of it, obtaining repayment. In this case, the first debenture holder had instructed the receiver, the receivers to a mortgager to disrupt the plans of the debt repayment by the second deben de debenture holder so that he would not in good faith so so that he was not in good faith um mm -hmm. and they said lord templeton um basically equity has developed two rules first the power conferred on the mortgagee must be exercised in good faith for the purpose of obtaining payment repayment and secondly that the subject to the first rule, powers conferred on the mortgagee may be exercised, although the consequences may be disadvantage disadvantageous to the borrower. Um, these principles and rules apply also to the re a receiver and manager appointed by the mortgagee. He also asserts that the first powers conferred on the mortgagee must be exercised in good faith for the purpose of obtaining repayment. And secondly, that the subject to the first rule powers conferred on the mortgagee may be exercised. All the consequences by the disadvantageous to the borrower, these principles and rules apply also to, to a receiver 
and manager appointed by the mortgagee. Negligence must not extend to the ma to managers or receivers for repayment of debt. The result would be selling of the asset to pay the debts as soon as possible, so as to avoid exposure to liability through exposure to liability. Liability, though this would not be necessarily be the not be necessarily in the interest of the company. Um, that was basically all that I found on it, and I was trying. I was trying to actually see if I could get find the case itself. I sent um, it to. Pardon me. I sent it to you just now. Okay, but I didn't get. The, but I didn't get the case. But um, when I started to go through through it, I noticed that it was a bunch of back and forth. But with one, with with the first and second <laughs> um, persons who had indebtedness and indentures in this and. One trying to outsmart the next one, and the next one trying to outsmart smart the, the next one. Okay, so look, look at the link I just sent to all of you, and you'll see the case there. And it also refers to the case that happened on appeal, so you can be able to read all of it. Um, when you send the link just now? Just now, yeah. And Ashley, you can send the one on Sylvan. Okay. Katie, so you want to do Quinell versus Maltby? Okay. You got it, right? Yes, yes, I do. And this is Down's view. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Kaylee, so you want to do Quinell? Yes, ma'am. Good night, all. No. Go ahead. So the case is on Quinell versus Mulbai and another. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not good with this. Okay, so the jits of this, or the summary, mm -hmm. Go ahead. is. Yes. Okay, it says the judge below is the right and it will open the gap to the protection which is offered to the tenant by the rent act. So we have Mr. Quinnell, who's the owner of a property, a very large home with about nine bedrooms. And he would normally rent it from time to time because it was nearby or it was near to colleges. Mr. Cornell um, secured the loan for 2,500 pounds and he executed a legal charge on August 13, 1974, where he had an agreement with Barclays Bank. So he would have mortgaged it with Barclays Bank or through Barclays Bank, where he would have obtained the funds. And in the legal charge, there was some clause that was attached. One of the clause that was attached was that he was not allowed, he was not allowed to rent or lease the property without a written consent from the bank. However, he still went along or still went ahead and leased this property. So this was the situation that bind Quinnell and the bank together. Now, Mr. Quinnell is interested in selling, he's interested in selling his property but he can't do it because of the lease agreement that he has with several tenants, one of which is Mr. Mulbai. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I got lost. No. 
paragraph four. Paragraph four, okay, thank you. So the tenancies of Mr. Mulby and Mr. Jack came to the end in December of 1974, where Mr. Mulby, his intentions initially was to go off to the United States. However, he did not proceed it with doing so. He did not proceed it with doing so. Um, so at that time, Mr. Cornell would have leased, would have leased the house to about two other tenants. The tenants, so he did several other students at all events. The important thing is to note is that the bank did not give consent for nobody to be in the house. Mr. Cornell, like I said, wanted to lease, I'm sorry. <laughs> he wanted to lease the house, but he could not, he wanted to sell the house, sorry, but he could not have sell the house because he still had tenants in the house. In order for him to sell the house, he would have had to have vacant possession. He would have had to have vacant possession. That tenancy lasted until December, 1976. Again, no one asked the bank for consent. No one realized it was necessary. And from January, 1977 on with the tenant rem remained it as statutory tenants, paying the rent to the agent. The position then arose that Mr. Cornell wanted to get possession of the house. If he could get vacant possession, he could sell it at a high price. It might be worth 30,000 pounds or 40,000 pounds with vacant possession. Mr. Cornell started proceeding the nuisance and annoyance, but he dropped them, obviously because he realized that it was not working. Then he went to the lawyer for advice after consulting them in October 1977, Mr. Cornell went to the bank and told them about the tenants in the house. The bank had, had not heard before about the various charges in the tenancies, even when they were told the bank made it clear that they had no intentions of taking any proceedings to enter the property or to turn the tenants out or anything of that kind the bank were not concerned to get possession. Then Mr. Cornell's lawyer in London advised him that there was a good way in which possession could be achieved. This is what it was. Mr. Cornell's wife, Mrs. Cornell, Cornell, paid off the bank. She paid 2,500 pounds, which was owing to the bank and took a transfer of the charge. The bank transferred it to her by the transfer dated January 17, 1978. Then Mrs. Cornell brought proceedings against the tenant, Mr. Mulby and Mr. Luton, seeking possession. She said that she stood in the shoes of the bank and seeing that the tenancies were granted without the consent of the bank, it was void. So she could recover possession. The judge accepted the submission. He held that the wife, Mrs. Cornell, was entitled to possession of the premises and could turn Mr. Mulby and all the other students out of the house. Now it has been held that when the bank holds a charge and there is a clause in it whereby there are to be no tenancies granted surrendering except with the consent of the bank in writing. Then in those circumstances, if the mortgager does not therefore for grant tenancies without the consent of the bank. The tenancies are not binding on the bank of the tenants are not entitled to the protection of the Rent Act. That was decided in Dooley and District Benefit Building Society versus Emerson 1949. Mrs. Quinnell relies on this case. She said that as for the transferring, sorry, transferring of the legal charge, she stands in the shoes of the bank and cannot obtain possession and can. So in so much words, she, the case was, she was right in what the law says. However, that law did not apply to what it was that they were trying to do. The judge accepted the submission. The decision, if right, opens the way to widespread evasion of the rent act. If the owner of the house wishes to obtain vacant possession, all he has to do is charge it to the bank for a small sum, then grant a new tenancy without telling the bank 
then get his wife to pay off the bank and take a transfer, then get the wife to sue for possession. If the judge has had accepted um, their point at any point, it would mean that anybody who is trying to vacate any tenant could have taken this route. The difference with this is that Mrs. Quinnell and Mr. Quinnell is one. So the bank, I mean, the, the judge had to be mindful of that as well. That indeed, what happened here in October 1977, when Mr. Quinnell went to the bank, he told them about the tenancies. They said that they did not intend to take possession. So he got Mistress Quinnell to do it in evidence. She said, I paid 2,500 pounds. This was for my husband. I took the charge to make the debt to the bank less onerous. I don't know. I, I don't know if I pronounced that right. I was aware he wanted to obtain possession of the house to sell it. I merely paid off the charge. These proceedings have been brought to get possession to sell. So the objective is plan. It was plain. not to enforce. Go ahead. Plan. So the objective is plan. Yes. Yeah. Um, it so it not... says, go ahead. Go ahead. The objective was was plain in so many in, in so much words, they had ulterior motive. So she ought to obtain repayment or anything of that kind. It was in order to get possession of the house and to overcome the protection act of the rent act. Mm -hmm. Is it permissible? It seemed to me that this is one of those cases where equity steps in to mitigate, 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 sorry, the rigor of the law. Long years ago, it did the same when it invented the equity of redemption, as it said in Snell's Equity 27th ED 1973. The court left the legal effect of the transaction unaltered, but declared it to be unreasonable and against conscience that the mortgage should retain as owner for his own benefit what was intended as a mere security. So here in modern times, equity can step in so as to prevent a mortgage or a transferee from him from getting possession of a house con contrary to the justice of the case. A mortgage will be retained restrained from getting possession except when it is sought bona fide and reasonable for the purpose of enforcing the security and then only submit to such conditions as the court think fit to impose. When the bank itself or a building society lends the money, then it may well be right to allow the mortgage to obtain possession when the borrower is in default. But so long as the interest is paid and there is nothing outstanding, equity has amplified power restrain any unjust use of the right to possession. It is plain that the transaction Mr. and Mistress Quinnell had an ulterior motive. It was not done to enforce the security or do payment of the principal or interest. It was done for the purpose of getting possession of the house in order to resell it at a profit. It was done so as to avoid the protection which the rent act affords the tenants in their occupation. If Mr. Quinnell himself had sought to evict the tenant, he would not be allowed to do so. He could not say the, ten the tenancies were, of, were, were void, sorry. He wouldn't stop from saying so. That certainly would be protected himself. Are they protected against his wife? Now that she is the transferee of the charge, in my opinion, they are protected. For this simple reason, she is not seeking possession for the purpose of enforcing the law or the interest or anything of that kind. She is doing it simply for the ulterior purpose of getting possession of the house, contrary to the intention of Parliament as expressed in the Rent Act. On the simple ground, it seemed to me that this action fails and it should be dismissed. The legal right to possession is not to be enforced when it is sought for an ulterior motive. I would, on this account, allow the appeal to dismiss the action for possession. Agreeing Bridge, LJ said, the situation arising in this case is one. It seemed to me in which the court is not only entitled 
but bound to look behind the formal legal relationship between the parties to see what is the true substance of the matter. Once one does that, on the fact of this case, it is the plan as a peak staff or enforce the security, which she holds as the transferee or the legal charge, but for the benefit of her husband as mortgagee to enable her to sell the property with the benefit of vacant possession. In substance, she is, I don't know what that word is, sorry, as an agent. What? Swan, as agent. Swine. Swine. I didn't hear you. Sue, to sue, suing. She oh, is suing. Okay. She is suing as, as an agent. agent. Mm. Which means that she is she's standing now in the shoe acting of the on his behalf. Mm. No. Acting okay. as the husband. Okay. That being so, it seems to be inevitable to follow that she can be in no better position in these proceedings than her husband would be if they had been brought in his name. Position mm -hmm. than her husband. Okay. They had been brought. Okay, where am I? I agree that the appeal right should be allowed. Also agreeing, I agree that the appeal should be allowed. The landlord, Mr. Quinnell, finally said that he judge. was encumbered. I didn't hear you, sorry. You can in and out. You can hear me? No, you were going in and out. Go ahead. Okay, the landlord, Mr. Quinnell, finding that he was encumbered by the statutory tenant and not able to reap the benefit of a sale with vacant possession, devised under advice a scheme whereby he might obtain vacant possession. It so happened that the landlord had mortgaged the property to his bank to secure his overdraft and other. Other borrowers in the mortgage contain a common form prohibition on any lending without the consent of the mortgage G bank. The lease to the statutory tenant was made by the landlord after the date of the mortgage without the consent of the bank and was therefore in breach of the landlord's covenant contained in the mortgage. That lease was binding on the landlord but void against the bank. The lease and the tenant became a statutory tenant as against the landlord, but not as against the bank. The landlord being unable to get possession from his own statutory tenant approach, the bank and asked the bank to bring an action against the tenant for possession. This would then enable the landlord to sell the property with the vacant possession. The bank very properly declined to take any such action, which was not required to protect their position as mortgagee, the amount of the debt owed to the landlord to the bank was £2,500. The rent payable to the tenant exceeded £1,000 a year, and the property was worth in a region of £30,000 to £40,000. The bank in these circumstances rightly refused to do for the landlord that which the landlord could not do for himself. The landlord, again, under advice, an undaunted conceived an ulterior method of obtaining vacant possession. His wife paid off the debt of 2,500 pounds owed to the bank by her husband, landlord, and the bank as it was bound to do, except that payment was transferred and the mortgage to his wife. The landlord's wife, I'm sorry, then the mortgagee was owed 2,500 by her husband and she at her request of her husband brought an action against the tenant and the possession claiming that the lease made by her husband is not binding on her as mortgagee and that she can therefore obtain possession and then sell to the benefit of her husband and her, and her husband, herself and her husband, sorry. As I say, the authorities established that as a matter of law, and lease made in breach of covenant by a mortgagee is void against the mortgagee 
and I assume for present purpose against the transferee unless the lease is adopted by the mortgagee, neither the bank nor the wife adopted the tenancies. The state rights and power of the mortgage, however, are only vested in the mortgagee to protect his possession as a mortgagee and enable him to obtain repayment. Subject to this, the property belongs in equity to the mortgager. In the present case, it is clear from the fact and the evidence that the mortgagee, Mistress Cornell, is not bona fide exercising her right and power for her own purpose as mortgagee, but for the purpose of enabling the landlord mortgager, her own husband, his contractual obligation and defeat the statutory tendencies of the tenant, which is binding on the landlord. Mistress Cornell does not even pretend to be acting in her own interest as mortgagee. She brings the action to oblige her husband. In my judgment, the court must therefore treat this action, although in form brought by the mortgagee, as an action brought for and on behalf of the landlord mortgager. The court shall deal with it as though the mortgager landlord were the plaintiff and on the biased possession will not be ordered. The appeal was allowed with costs of the court of appeal and below. Legal aid taxation ordered for the successful plaintiff. All right. So you see, um, Kawami, the difference in your case and this one? Yes. They, they for the scheme? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I see the difference. <laughs> Everybody's scheming all over the place. <laughs> so now you see when you go before the court, how the court thinks? In terms of, yes, he had a place, yes, he had tenants, but he had a covenant. There's a provision within his mortgage deed stating that if he wanted to let or rent, he had to get the bank's prior consent. And without doing that, of course, the agreements were void. So he came up with him because he wanted to, he wanted to sell it and make some money. So he gave, he let his wife pay it off. And then she in turn then wanted to see if she could sell it. But what, what did the court say? She became his agent. So it's just like him selling it. And in equity, they will not allow that because it is not fair and it is not just. So he breached the covenant. But it's, it's the same covenant that uh, I think the, um, um, that they have for, these, for the government subdivisions and whatnot right now, whereas they, in order to sell the properties, you have to get the minister approval um, in connection with them, basically. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and you have to, do, I think all of the houses also have to be owner occupied, right? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. They can't be rented. Right. So basically, is is the same thing as getting permission in order to, 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 to have it done. I think, and that's another issue. They, they, I think, when the Yellow Elder area started to add on houses. That was one of the issues that also came up. Uh, can they actually do that? Can they add on efficiencies to rent if they do not own the properties? Right, because any property that's sold right now um, that comes through government subdivision has to get, like I just said, um, approval through from the minister. Yes. Okay. Who else? But I think it's after a certain. I think it's after a certain amount of time, I think a certain amount of years or the amount of payments you've made and you can yeah. actually make adjustments to it. You mean adjustments to that you mean adjustments to the house or, yes, to, or, or, for, or for selling or for selling the property? Adjustments the to the house. Okay. But wouldn't it be, Miss Archer, then not so much time, but how much equity you have in the property? to maybe offset what's still outstanding and not so much the time has passed, but the amount of equity? Yes, it would be equity. It would be equity. But I think we were, we were mixing two things up just yes. now. One, we were talking about adding on, and the other one was in terms of adding on any... Because then you change, you're going against the terms of the, of the, the covenants that are in the mortgage deed. You can add on based on your equity, add on another room. 
but we're talking about in terms of if you're adding on to rent and you still have an existing mortgage. Ms. Atra, when we um, go to the next person, can we, uh, would you be able to send us the, um, the PDF so we can follow through as they go through it? Okay. Because I know that you sent us a few, but it's nothing, none of the, um, the ones we're talking about now. I just want to, so we could just follow through as they go through it. Okay. Not a problem. Do you want me to send you for next call to be? Please. Yeah, I can send you that one right now. Hold on one second. Who's go? Who's next? Kenneth? Hello. Yes. Oh, if Kenneth could send us, since Kenneth is going next, I guess yeah. we could send us so we could go, um, go through oh. with him. Kenneth, you want to see us? I can locate that right now. See if you can. If anybody else up there is ready, they can while Kenneth is looking. LaShawn? Good night, Ms. Archer. I need you to send me the um, case for Baxter versus Gap because I only found like a summary of it. I never found the actual case study. Okay. Do so you have that one handy so you can send that to me, please? No, I don't have that one handy. I'll have to look that one up for you for next class. So we don't take too much time. Okay. I might I read the summary of it. But I don't know. Hold on. Let me see. No, I'll look at it for you and send it to you. Okay, thanks. You can do it next class. Okay. Okay, give me one quick minute. Okay, I just sent the link just now for Quinnell. Good night, Mr. Archer. Good night. Um, I I sorry I was a little bit late and I was I was in and out. Okay. Can can in regards to the, the discussion I was at the end, can you not build an efficiency on something that's already as a mortgage on it is, is that it depends, against the law? It depends, not the law. It depends on what are the, the covenants within your mortgage deed. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But is that like a common thing to have that in your covenant? In your deed? Mm, it's Would there it's something be like restricting? Uh -huh. Go ahead. It's mo it's mostly for like you know the garden homes like the new um initiative that they have going on now. Let's say if you decided that you want to apply for one of the homes and you're selected, mm -hmm. inside of the agreement, um, it would basically explain to you that after a few years, then you could actually make change. Like you can't even add anything on. You can't do no work to the home until after a certain period of time. So, but it's all of that is in the agreement. And if you go against it, it's like, I mean, I guess they could put you in court or, you know, you could basically um, go against the agreement. But it's mainly for like government homes, though. That's mainly what it is. It's not if you purchase your own property and build your own home. I think it's different. Okay, okay. Thanks. No problem. Okay, I think that's the link there, okay? Okay. Okay, when you're ready, you can begin. Okay, this is the Court of Appeals of Hong Kong in the case between Se Kuang Lam the appellant versus Wong Chet Sen and others. Mm -hmm. This is an appeal whereby in 
um, just to give a summary in 1963, um, the appellant arranged for the construction of a building um, which housed, which um, was to be uh, duly constructed, 15 stories with 90 units consisting of six shops on the ground floor, 12 offices on the first and second floor, and 72 flats on the third to the 14th floor. Now, or by February 28, 1966, the building was completed, and 36 of the, of the flats um, were sold, had been sold, but um, 54 of them um, remain um, unsold, notwithstanding that um, the price was reduced um, a few times. Okay, now, by a notice dated the 28th of February, 1966, the mortgage the informed the borrower that unless um, certain arrears of interest amounting to $76,548 were paid on or before the 29th of March, 1966, that the mortgagee would exercise his power of sale without further notice. Now, by the notice date on the 20th of April, 1966, the mortgagee requested payment of all the principal monies and interest secured by the mortgage and warned that in default of the payment on the 29th of May, 1966, the mortgagee would exercise his power of sale. Particulars of this power of sale um, were prepared by the mortgagee solicitor son were dated 9th of June, 1966. Now, um, a part of this condition of sale noticed that there would be a reserve price um, and that the vendor reserved the right to bid generally by himself or his agents or to withdraw the property at any time. The particulars were um, the purchaser, sorry, were to pay 20% of this purchase price on the date of the auction and was to pay the balance on or before the 23rd of July, 1966. The, um, and time was made of the essence. Now, surprisingly, on the 20th of June, 1966, the Mogaji and his wife, the second respondent, Wang Chen Wei Sok, held a meeting of the directors of the third respondent's company, Chetsin Company Limited, at which it was um, resolved um, that the wife be appointed to attend the offices of the of um, the Lawman brothers before 3 p.m. and on the 26th of June. And in particular, the bidding price um, shall be shall not exceed $1.2 million. At that time, the directors of the company were three in number, namely the Mogaji and the Mogaji's wife and the Mogaji's eldest son. The board meeting was held on the 20th of June, 1966. It was not attended by the eldest son who was abroad. Now, on the 26th of June, the Mogaji, accompanied by his wife, his solicitor, and his solicitor's managing clerk, attended the auction and informed the auctioneer that the reserve price for the property was $1.2 million. The Mogaji and his wife occupied seats in the front row, which, according to the man, uh, managing clerk, usually were occupied by the Mogaji and his advisors. The auctioneer introduced the property and announced that the reserve price was $1.2 million and invited bids from the 30 to 40 persons present. Surprisingly, there were no bids until the Mogaji's wife bid $1.2 million and the property was knocked down to her. So in essence, um, um, the Mogaji's wife won the bid, seeing that no one else had bid it. So as a result of that, um, the Mogajors um, um, settled this appeal, um, claiming that um, the amount, um, 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 give me one minute. Da -da -da -da. I'm a little, I'm um, sorry, give me one minute. Got a little lost here, sorry. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Yeah.
Yeah, okay. Council for the um, borrower, sorry, um, submitted that the sale um, to the company should be set aside because the mortgagee who sold the property was interested in the company which bought the property. There, and that there was a conflict, conflict of interest between the highest price and the interest, hold on, hold on, um, highest price as the vendor in, um, in obtaining the highest price and the interest in the um, mortgage in the company as purchaser to pay the lower, lower price, lowest price. A sale for the mortgage to the company in which he was interested would only be upheld if the sale was at arm's length and the mortgage paid, played no part in the decision of the company to buy or in the implementation of that decision. Now, counsel for the uh, mortgage submitted that a mortgage may exercise its power of sale in favor of the company in which the mortgage is interested, but must satisfy the mortgage or, or the court that the mortgage took reasonable steps to obtain the true market value. In the present case, the mortgage, the mortgage property was purchased by the company at an auction, which the court below described as unimpeachable or impeccable. The price bid by the company and accepted by the auctioneer represented the true market value because no bidder, no higher bidder was received. Both counsel received an authority of their submissions. So this um, case runs on for, these submissions run on for quite a while. That's 18 pages. Yes. Um, the submission assumes that such an auction must um, produce the best price reasonable, reasonably obtained or express the test, the true market value. But the price obtained at any particular au au auction may be less than the price attainable by the private treaty and may depend on the steps taken to encourage bidders to attend. An auction which only produces one bid is not necessarily an indication that the true market value has been received. So um, they're saying that the Maoji had ample opportunity to um, consult um, and instruct um, estate agents. They run on to say that um, that um, the mortgage, the mortgage um, could have done it differently, whereby he could have um, consulted and instructed the state agents. The property could have been offered for sale by auction or by private treaty or by announcing that the property would be sold by public auction, if not previously sold by private treaty. But um, to get down to the nitty gritty of it, because that runs on forever, it says in all circumstances, of, um, of the present case, however, taking into account the delays for which the borough was responsible and the deficiencies of the pleadings and the evidence and cross-examination, their lordship considered that the borrower is only entitled to receive from the mortgage, mortgagee and the company jointly and severally 50% of the cost of the trial and the appeal to the court of appeal and the appeal to the board. The response, the respondents must pay their own costs. Their, um, their Lordship will accordingly humbly advise Her Majesty that this appeal should be allowed in accordance with the terms set out in their um, Lordship judgment, Lordship's judgment and the draft minutes of the order settled by counsel attached thereto and that the action ought to be remitted to the Court of Appeal of Hong Kong for the court to make their directions as may be considered necessary for the assessment of damages by the High Court. So the minutes of that order um, reads as follow, which isn't long. It says, it declares that the sale of the uh, respondent to the respondent, Chet Sin Company Limited, of the property comprised in the mortgages mentioned in the proceedings or not to be set aside. It further states that order that an inquiry be made as to the sum net of the course of sale, which the respondent, Wong Chit Sen, would have received on the 24th of June, 1966. If he had properly exercised the power of sale conferred on him by the mortgages mentioned in the pleadings, 
and have taken all the reasonable care to obtain the true market value of the property comprised in the said mortgage on that day in order that the amount, if any, by which the said, um, said, said, said net sum exceeds Hong Kong 1.182 um, one million one hundred eighty-two thousand seven hundred eighty-three dollars be certified, in order that the account, that an account may be taken of interest on the amount, if any, certified in accordance with the foregoing provisions of this order at the rate of one point four percent calendar month for from the twenty-fourth of June nineteen sixty-six until the date of the certification of the said amount, in order that the amount of such interest be certified. An order that the respondent, Wong Chet Sen, do pay to the appellant the aggregate of the amount, if any, certified as aforesaid, together with interest on such aggregate sum at the rate for, uh, for the time being applicable to judgment debts for the said, from the said date of the certification date until payment. Okay. Thank you very much. So Lashan, I, I sent the link for Baxter and Gap. You could do that next class. Camille, you have Swing Castle or you'll be ready next class. Is Camille on? Yes, Camille is on. Camille, you're able to find Swing Castle? Um, I found a summary for Swing Castle. But not the full thing. Not the full thing. I can okay. download. Let me see part, part of it. As for you, give the summary, but I'll see if I can find it for you for next class. Okay. Um, this is basically Sin Castle versus Alistair Gibson. And it had to do with a surveyor. Um, the bank was claiming that basically they lent money to a high risk borrower at an initial interest rate of 36% which under the terms of the loan would rise to 45% immediately on any default in repayment. When the borrower defaulted, the lender repossessed and resold the property and then sued the negligent value, valuer for its total losses, including interest rates at the stipulated contractual rate, which was basically they sued him for the, to get the higher rate. The House of Lord rejected this part of the lender's claim on the basis that it would effectively put the valuer in the position of a guarantor of the borrower's repayment obligation. It was held that the lender was entitled instead to damages reflecting the reasonable cost that it, it had incurred in financing the loan and affect interest at a reasonable commercial rate. So they were saying, um, in the absence of any evidence as to how the lenders finance the loan or evidence showing how the money is lent to the borrowers, borrowers could have been profitably employed. They considered that 12% instead of the 45% rate would be more reasonable to charge against the surveyor than the uh, 30, 45%. So they granted in favor that they would have to repay the, the surveyor would have to pay for some of the damages, but he would, just would not have to pay it at that high, high rate of 45%, which basically was the case. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna find the full Senate and couple. Because I found something, but it's just, I couldn't access all of the points on the document that I found. I just was able to get the summary of basically, but. I'll find, I'll get the full thing. I'll send in, in, in a few minutes. Oh. Oh, Laurie? Is, there, is there a special way to search? Because I, this is, these are difficult to find to get everything, all the information. Yeah. No. It's not... How do you normally find yours? Um, I just put the name in and then there are different options. And if you take, okay. The one that, that she, Twin Castle versus Alistair, right? So let me go back. I put in Swing Castle Limited versus Alistair Gibson. I have different sites. One is www.isurv. I know that wouldn't help me. The second one says 
swab, S-W-A-R-B dot C-O dot U-K. You've noticed that before? Swab dot co. Once you hit swab dot co dot U-K, it gives you a summary. So it says, when you hit it, it says, Swing Castle Limited versus Alistair Gibson, House of Lords, 1991. It gives you a summary. At the end of the summary, if you go right down to the bottom, just before the word citing, it gives you a citation. Citation means that's the, the, the volume of the book where it bears the full case. So it says 1991 to all, that means all England, A-L-L-E-R 353, that's the page. So all I have to do now is go back to my name and put in the citation and the full document will come up. You want to try it now? You put okay, it so in? When you put in this, the, the Swing Castle versus Alistair Gibson, and you see, which, which site was it? The one that says HTTPS colon two backslash mm -hmm. SWARB. You don't type that in, it will come up. You see it? The first one that comes up says www.isurv.com, not that one. The next one says swarb.co.uk. Do you see that one? I don't see it. You don't have that in your someone else. Anyone has that? Okay, it's you saying the S W A R B because when I put up swing, I get S W A R B dot C O dot U K. Right. Click Swing Castle under that. You see the summary comes up. Swing Castle versus Gibson, and then they have a lendum. Uh huh. Go down. Go yeah, down. I have it. Okay, go down. Uh huh. For the citing. You see the word citing in bold and black? Yes, ma'am. Just that to the citation. Just say it again. You sorry, you went out. Just click. Just above, no, just above citing, you're going to see what we call the citation. That's the okay. book. And then it says in 1991, uh -huh. A-L-E-R 353. You see it? Yes, ma'am. 1991 to all ER 353. Uh, and then again, 1991 to L-R 191. Uh -huh. So that's yeah. two different books. So you try, so you go back, do your hour and go back, go back to your Swing Castle versus um, stuff where you have, where you typed it in Google mm -hmm. and our station now. Okay, try that. Add what? Right, 1991, close bracket, two, A-L-L-E-R, <coughs> Three five three. Um, I suggest put that in and then hit search. Yeah, you have to sometimes it takes a while, but you'll get it. That's how I find all besides going and actually getting the book. Thing I guess it's not coming up. No, it's still giving me. A, it's still taking me back to that. Oh, hold on. No, it did. Let me show you. Go down to one, two, three, four. 
You see a citation here called www.unicef.ca. The first one says swab. The next one says again, ISURV. The third mm -hmm. one says CMS dot hyphen law now. Mm -hmm. Fourth one says UNISCT dot CA. It says UNICEF dot CA. That's the only one I don't see. That gives you the full gigs. Two and a half. What do you need? What do you need? I just trying to I thought it was like an hour. No, we only do this once a week. Okay, I mean we could look, look at it later so we don't um but I found it. I didn't... I mean, how they change it? Yeah, I'll try to keep finding um go to the all the pages and see if we can Easy is easy. If I, use, if I use, look here. Okay, try it in and you'll see. You'll find it. Okay, so let's go. Anybody else has another case? No? Darius, you came in late. You have your Albany homes? So I was just going to say the same thing. I got a summary as well. All right. Uh, but give, I don't give, have... give, give the summary in and I'll send you all the full case. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so in this summary, this is uh, from what I got from it. I didn't really get the, I guess, I still have some questions on it, but I can let you know anyway. So this is Albany um, Home Loans versus uh, Mr. Massey. They already was given permission to uh, repossess the property from, from Mr. Massey. But he's appealing now, as I understood, because he had a couple of reasons. Uh, and one was that, the reason why he couldn't pay his mortgage anymore was he got let go from the job that he was working at. So he couldn't pay the mortgage anymore. And that job actually was an associate of the plaintiff that repossessed his home. And he was also a mortgage provider. Um, but the problem, the issue with the whole um, repossession is that he was actually married and both of them with uh, the mortgages, but the repossession only said that he had to leave. So the problem is they ordered him to leave, but the wife still had possession of the property. Um, and, that's, and that's still what I get from the case in general. Um, I, what I saw is that I believe they still said that they agreed with Albany Bank, Albany Home Loans, and that the defendant and his wife, I believe, had to leave the property. That's what I get from the summary. All right. So for next class, full thing, sending it to you, right? Just sent it. Okay. That's the full thing. So who need the center of? full report for now. I need to send one for a swing castle. Albany, I just sent that. Parker, Parker Tweedale. Who's that? Parker Tweedale versus Dunbar Bank. Uh-huh. You found that? No, I need I need the I have a summary. I don't have the full thing. Okay. I'll find the full thing. Just that one. That one. Um Gabrielle you found Sadiq. Gabrielle on. I'll look for Sadiq too. I'll look for Sadiq. Doing care. And Parker. And that should be it, eh? Yeah, because the rest I've sent already. So that's just three I owe you. All right, I heard, I heard, I heard someone, someone's relative saying, "I thought this class was an hour." Yes, Laurie. <laughs> I didn't say anything. 
Yes. No, I have to do the cases because when you look at the same chapter we're doing now, chapter five, you mm -hmm. will see it's, it speaks about the mortgagor's duties. That's the borrower. And you can see a lot of borrowers, like I always tell students, they do not read the mortgage deed. They do not read the covenants at all. And they actually have this mindset that they can do whatever they feel like doing. And it doesn't work that way. That's the key thing that they have to remember. They must read the document. Don't just sign the document. And when you talk about the power of sale, these cases bring out what the mortgagee and the mortgagor, what they can and what they cannot do. So they say that once the mortgagee has sold the mortgage property under power of sale, it is the trustee of the proceeds. And it always have to avoid a breach of trust action. So they have to pay all the prior encumbrances. They have to pay the costs of the sale. They have to make sure the monies are payable under the mortgage agreement, any subsequent mortgagee, and of course, the mortgagor. Any surplus funds must be paid to the mortgagor and any shortfall in the sale permits the mortgagee to sue the mortgagor independently for the remaining debt in a separate action for the recovery of the debt. The mortgagor covenants to the mortgagee that he or she is the beneficial owner of the mortgage property. And that's an implied promise by the mortgagor that he has the power to convey the property. The mortgagor also covenants that the mortgagee is entitled to possession and that the mortgagor will execute further documents to perfect the mortgagee's title if required. And that he or she has not done anything, nor will he or she do anything that will prevent the mortgage from operating according to its terms. Regard to leaseholds, the mortgagor also covenants as the beneficial owner and or landlord that the lease is valid and that all of the obligations under the lease have been and will be performed. So when it comes to insurance, the mortgagor is required to insure the property and keep it in good repair and condition. Now this is always a very contentious part of the mortgage agreement. If the mortgagor defaults in this obligation, the bank or the mortgagee is permitted to do so. However, the cost to insure the mortgage property will constitute a secure debt and effectually gives the bank the power to apply insurance monies to repairing the property and or discharging the debt. I have a question. Go ahead, I know you have one because I'm about to tell you some of the banks are pulling away from this. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. No. okay. You go ahead, you go ahead. You Okay, you 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 mark you take out a mortgage, and the mortgagor is required to insure the property, but the mortgagor didn't. But the mortgagor thought that the mortgagee had insured the property. So mm -hmm. now here comes Hurricane Dorian, and the mortgagor finds out that the bank did not pay the insurance. In a case like that, how does the mortgage or or you go any further, go back to the very beginning? Whose duty was it to insure? The mortgage or okay. Is required to insure. Okay. But then, but then it also said that if the, the, the mortgagee, if the mortgage or doesn't, then the mortgagee would do it and it'd be at a cost to the mortgage or. Oh, right. Okay. Go ahead. So Hurricane the mortgagee nor the mortgagee, none of them took out the insurance on the home. Mm -hmm. And here comes a major storm and wiped out everything. Mm -hmm. The mortgage does the mortgage or have to continue paying the bill after he has lost everything. But he turns around and sues the bank. Does he stand a chance to win? No. Uh, 
<laughs> mm -mm. What does section 21B of the Act say? The Conveyance and Law of Property Act, hmm? which where mortgage, mortgage where mortgage is made by the has the power into a leader. That one? Mm hmm To ensure and keep insured against loss or damage by fire, any building, or any effect or property of an insurable nature, whether affixed to the freehold or not, being or forming part of the mortgaged property. And this and the premise and the premium paid for any such insurance shall be a charge on the mortgaged property. In addition to the mortgage money and with the same priority and with interest at the same rate as the mortgage money. Okay. So just like you said, whenever you fail, then it's expected that the bank will pay. So but they don't necessarily pay. Right. So the only way you're going to come back now against the bank is you're going to say the bank was negligent. But it's, but it's not a duty of the bank. It is a duty on the mortgagee. I was about to ask how is it the bank becoming negligent if they don't pay if they don't pay it if the mortgager is the individual who has who has total responsibility for it right, right. but as I read in the and through the a bank as you would have mentioned in, in some cases they take the um, the responsibility of paying the insurance and they just charge the mortgage that is added to the interest or added to the to the loan if they're not paying the the insurance because obviously they have to protect their investment in the event yeah. that there's a natural disaster but but a lot of the banks before hurricane dorian was pushing away from that it, it became too complicated not Did only it, that. the bank paid then you paid then you want to claim back then you mm. um you, you, you paid it you paid it the value then there is a disaster. There is a, mm -hmm. a disagreement between you and the bank and the balance of the debt to be paid. It really got messy. Mm -hmm. And I can understand the bank's them um, um, moving away from it. If, if now the property is valued more than, the, than what is owed. But I can't see I can't see them uh, moving away from it if they have um, a lot more to lose if if the if everything is less than what is what is owed. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, vice versa. Mm -hmm. But you but you realize you realize why some of of the large commercial banks have outsourced this. This is a management function of its own, especially in a in a, a belt area. Where there is the, the 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 chances of a disaster is what seventy percent. Mm. It's a real risk. But then that would be why they would that why they would take a um so, sorry want to ensure at the end of the day that it is done. Now I know they uh, I at least I think they're moving away from the life insurance portion of it, the mandatory um, life insurance. Yeah. But um, the, the situation with the homeowner's insurance and the property, um, I think they're keeping those. Or at least I would, you know, I, I'd say them keeping them. But I don't I forget, think... if you insure, you add that to the mortgage. Yes, because that is a, that is a tax on you. But the, right. problem is, um, the problem comes into play when the individual becomes delinquent or no longer paying, mm -hmm. then you now adding more onto the loan and nothing is actually coming in to pay the, to pay, to pay the mortgage. So, yes. you know, so, so they, I guess it's a risk based on your portfolio as a risk function to see whether or not they um, want to do, want to deal with it. But I'm right. pretty sure they're going to have it inside of the, in the agreement that I guess there's going to be penalties if they don't pay the insurance. Because at the end of the day, the bank have to protect their investment regardless. So they're going to have some sort of penalty if they don't pay the insurance, whereas they still are able to benefit from it. But if you don't pay your insurance, the, the situation is still going to be at the end of the day that 
you're still owing more so, on the mortgage and the mortgage um, balance is increasing yeah. and then the interest is adding on it and then you you now have compiled interest on top of that so you know uh, i i don't see no penalties and i I, I'm in connection with it being able to to um, ab absorb that. Yeah, it's not a penalty because it is your duty. So if you don't pay it, then the bank will pay it, and it's all on like he's saying. And in the end, that's how the houses are up for sale because they can't. Make when, obviously, when the bank pay it, they would add it to their to the interest. Added. Yeah, it's added on. But my question is, with, with this whole insurance thing, does this um, apply to just um, vacant land because obviously yes it is an investment on the bank's end but you know there's really no damage could be done to the land the insurance from what i understand doesn't um apply the, to the vacant land it only applies to the home the home um, oh, okay that's that's what i want to, i want to right. make sure of that okay so but if you're building on it that's still because let's say you only want to grant to the bank just for the land only you're building out of your pocket to build your property. You still have, you're not obligated to insure it, correct? You mean you're if you up the bell cost? Correct. Not if you don't have to go, you don't oh. go into the brief. You're doing it on your own, no. Mm, okay. Yeah. That's your loss if you don't if you don't insure it because at the end oh, of the correct. day, the mortgage is only $55,000. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm just using the property loan is only fifty five thousand dollars, and you're down to to thirty thousand dollars. But you um, already put equity in the place of another um, forty thousand uh, dollars. But you only owe the bank twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars. You still that's at your loss or something happens. Okay. Okay. As well mm -hmm. as most persons will refer most persons will well most I wouldn't say most our financial institution what they would ask the member to provide or their contractor to provide since they're billing out of pocket is some um, all risk insurance. Um, and that's what the contractor will provide in the event that something happens. Because you don't want to start something and then something happen and then it mess up. You still mm -hmm. have to go back to the bank. Um, but but the bank, it's, it's at your risk. Yeah. No, but but the, bank, the, the bank isn't concerned about that um, if um, they're not holding Holding the mortgage over the billing portion of it, if only for the land. Correct. Okay. So the all yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so the all risk insurance, um, because that's like the individuals, like like Ms. Archer said at the beginning of this course, going to individuals and doing peace piece and saying, like, yeah, I'll get my boy to do this and get my boy to do that and then move on from here and until they get the belt. That's out of pocket. There's, there isn't any insurance in connection with that. Someone oh, yeah. runs that building, that's it. Right. So it's only if they are coming for a property with the intentions to build is where the all risk in black applies. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, I can add a little clarification to that if possible. Um, oh, yeah. the, the bank only looks at, um, at you needing insurance for the building. If they loan you the money for that um, for the um, that building, yeah. that's the only time they're interested. Um, mm -hmm. And you find even when um, you've um, basically had the building, then the bank um, issued you money for it. The bank will ensure that that building stays insured until their last penny, okay, or until it is um, almost paid off. Now, once that's paid off, the bank is not interested any longer. So it's up to you now, whereby. You decide whether I'm going to continue paying an insurance or not. That's up to you. Mm -hmm. So after you've paid it off, if you decide not to insure it and a hurricane comes, that's your loss. I, Ms. Asha, I think this is like one of the issues where I was saying, I think there's a difference in our laws and the laws in the U.S. because I guess in my mind this would be a risk of loss issue. It's more of a contractual issue that once you sign that contract, as they indicated for that building, that the loss shifts to the buyer. Whereas our laws don't really spell that out as clearly that once you sign or to say I'm getting this money to build this house, that it's now my risk if I lose the building and I am still indebted to the bank for the mortgage. 
So I think that's one of those those issues that I was I, I was looking for to clarify here. So I guess that was a good example of that. So once you once you're indebted to the bank, yeah. Once you're indebted for an amount, you have to count, um, carry the insurance. Mm -hmm. That's that's mandatory. Once well, you that's, over... that may be on the bank's end, but if you look at the legislation, it says I have the power to, not that I shall. It's not saying it's mandatory. It's saying I have the power to insure. Now the and bank that's... may say. Yeah, you must insure it, but the legislation does not clearly say that I must insure it. it just gives me yeah. the power to. Yeah, and so that's the, what I was saying. That but, nuance is is there. But the bank won't allow you to not have it insured. Oh. Yes, but see, you're looking at the contract between the person and the bank, and not necessarily the legislation. And that's what I was saying was an issue for me. Is I needed to understand the difference in the jurisdictions. And that could cause a problem because, like you said, the legislative law it would supersede every other law in the land, um, or even even the contracts, because you can't go against the legislation, or you shouldn't go against the legislation. Um, so, but um, so I'm basically thinking at the end of the day, the bank will still have it insured, or may want it insured, just to, not to have the issues with the clients at the end of the day, um, coming back and saying that, hey, look here, I paying for something I, I don't have. So I'm thinking that's more of the reason why they would insist on having it insured. Yeah, but then at the same time, the bank would just, they could just deny um, giving you the mortgage if you're not going to um, have the home insured or pay for the insurance, because at the end of the day, you're borrowing the money from them. You, you, like, you need the money from them to get mm -hmm. the home. So although it's a part of the legislation, if that, that being said, you should just build your home out of your pocket. I think that's the only way it relates to that or it would be beneficial. But not necessarily, Mr. Smith, because if you think about it, the bank makes money from lending money. So it doesn't help anybody if they everyone builds out of pocket. The bank needs to make the money just as much as we need to borrow the money. So if we keep the, 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 the funds flowing, everybody makes money, the, except for the person borrowing, of course, but the bank makes money from it. But I just was saying there was a discrepancy in the legislation, that's all. Not that they, they can't do it, but. No, but at the same time, they have to protect their investment because that's an Correct. investment. Correct, and I wish you on that. Right. Mm. Yep. Yeah, now. Section 21 speaks to the, who's the mortgagee? The mortgagee is the bank. Correct. Yeah. The bank has the power to insure. But remember now, you as the borrower, the mortgagee, mortgage or you sign a contract mm -hmm. and in that contract you have a cheat sure but when you don't insure it can't do so because they have the power to do so but that duty is higher than that power especially when it comes to you not insuring when you know you should have but they can do it in order to protect their investment So let's look at the maintenance and upkeep of the mortgage property. The mortgagor is also required to pay all rates, assessments, stamp duty, charges, and real property taxes. And that's why you see at the, at the beginning of each year, what do they ask you to do at the bank? They ask you to bring a copy of what? Your receipt where you paid your real property taxes. Before that, you see people come and bring in the real property tax bill, the light bill, the water bill, all of these things for the bank to pay on an ongoing basis. And that is discouraged. If the property falls into disrepair and has to be sold under the mortgagee's power of sale for default of payment of the mortgage debt by the mortgagor, and the proceeds are insufficient to satisfy the outstanding principal and interest, the mortgage property may be sold at an undervalue to its true market value and the mortgagee may pursue an action for debt against the mortgagor in order to receive the, the outstanding funds. The mortgagor has a contractual obligation to inform the bank of any encumbrances, any encroachments, nuisances, disputes, zoning, town planning, and any other matters that would affect the mortgage property. So now you know in the Bahamas, we introduced our legislation in 2017, the Homeowners Protection Act. And in that act, it gave certain privileges to homeowners of, of 
homes. First thing is the highlight of the app. Banks must give specific notice before they exercise their power of sale. Persons contributing to the mortgage payments, not just the mortgagor, may approach the court for relief. The court may make orders to vary the mortgage payment. The banks are under duty of fair dealing. Directors or employees and the relatives may not purchase mortgage property. Under certain circumstances, when the power of sale is exercised and the sale does not realize the principal and interest, the mortgage may nevertheless be discharged. The mortgagors may choose their own lawyers and surveyors and banks may not add the fee for another lawyer or surveyor to the mortgage. Under certain circumstances, transfers of mortgages are free or stamp duty. Heavy penalties for violating the provisions of the act, and that's towards the banks. So there is a willingness of the mortgagee to discuss the breach with the mortgagor with a view to entering into an agreement with the mortgagor regarding redress, including modification of the mortgage terms if possible. Contact information for the mortgagee, including an address to which a mortgagor may come in person and a telephone number. And so some of these key features of the Homeowners Act gives that obligation of the mortgagee to give notice prior to instituting any court proceeding. They give the right of the mortgagor to apply to the court for relief and the power of the court to grant relief to the mortgagor. Now I give you all a, a case connected to Homeowners Protection Act. Turn to the case of the Bank of the Bahamas versus the maker. What page are you on? That was 49. See where it says um, at, almost at the top, Homeowners Protection Act. Correct. Okay. I want us to turn to the case. I sent it to you all last week. The Bank of the Bahamas versus the Maycox. Anyone read it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go. Tell me about it, Kwame. And he said, yes, you know, <laughs> I mean, I actually read it. <laughs> you should have read anyway. it. I it. Huh? Sent it. Mr. Pratt yeah. didn't sent it. Yeah, I got it. I got it from, from Miguel. I, I, I read through it. It was, it was, an, it was an interesting read. Um, okay, get started. get started. All right. Basically, it was, uh, how should I start this? The mortgage. They had an issue with their with their house in um, I guess in, in the Eastwood subdivision, the mortgage, um, the mortgage premises for the security. Uh, they um, were supposed to pay, I guess, four thousand to five thousand dollars monthly mortgage on the on the account uh, um, to, to, to Bank of Bahamas every month for the mortgage. Apparently, apparently uh, when things was good, both were able to do their portion. The wife was was supposed to do, I guess, um, thirteen hundred dollars or fourteen hundred. Uh, basically, half of it. It was going half half, where the wife did half and the husband did half. Uh, the, the husband lost his job. Uh, the wife had a salary deduction coming in from her place of employment from beginning to end, and they was making the payments on the mortgage, and the, and the mortgage continued to come in. The issue came into play. When the husband, um, when they went to court, nobody, um, I think Bank of Bahamas um, said, okay, you pay in half the mortgage, but it isn't sufficient to cover the mortgage. It isn't the agreement. It isn't what was, what was said or the arrangement. Uh, so they in turn put them and put both parties in court with respect um, to the mortgage. The both party, um, nobody showed up for the for the mortgage, um, for for the um, what that is the order, 
the initial mm -hmm. order, the initial um, order, nobody showed up, and Bank of Bahamas, I guess, was granted judgment um, in 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 connection with it. Uh, they had the affidavits from the police officers, um, and also the evidence where the documentation was signed, everything was in order, and the courts granted um, granted them judgment, um, again, uh, basically judgment. The client's salary deduction was still coming in all this time through through the entire mortgage. Um, because it was coming in during this time, I guess they figured, well, that, that should be sufficient. Now, when the um, bank said, hey, look, yeah, we want to do a writ of possession, I guess, by, in 2020, the clients then in turn, the Maycox then in turn said, okay, uh, no, no, we want our house, or uh, not in 2020, prior to all of this, let me go back, prior to this, the make um they they said they was gonna work with the Maycox. They, they came back in, they was gonna work with the Maycox. The Maycox in turn said, okay, I will we will try to see if we could get a um two hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan and we'll pay you off, pay Bank of Bahamas off completely. Bank of Bahamas accepted this arrangement, say, okay, we can take that and, and we'll move forward. The $250,000, um, they went to another financial institution and was unable to get it. All this time, meanwhile, the salary deduction was coming in place and the, dedu the deduction kept coming. I keep mentioning the salary deduction because it's going to play an important part in the judgment later on down, down the line. The, the deduction kept coming in. The bank in turn said, okay, uh, you didn't live up to that arrangement. So in 2020, they say, okay, uh, we now have to put in for a writ of possession. We can repossess the house for you. Now, the issue is that they were granted the judgment in 2012. And I think the law states that six years after, you have six years in which you have to file a writ of possession or to take possession once after the judgment, you have six years in which to act upon that judgment. So the bank in turn from 2012 to 2020 just said, okay, we will do the writ now. Okay, um, after all this time. They, uh, the the, um, the, the Maycox in turn say, no man, you can't take my house. The time has already passed. Um, basically, uh, because the time has already passed, uh, you, the, um, everything is statue Barbie, so you can't take my house. Six years has passed, that's what happened. They in turn say, no, that don't work like that. Uh, the, the, bank, the bank went back, they put in a, a, a writ against the, sorry, they put in an order against the bank to set aside the, the vacant possession. Uh, that didn't, um, to put in order to set aside the vacant possession. The vacant, they couldn't set aside the vacant possession. At least the judgment came down at the end of the day to say that, hey, um, okay, you put in this now, uh, the appearance, and you put in an, uh, an order now to set aside the vacant possession, but um, based on the Homeowners Protection Act and everything else like that, the bank did every, or gave you every opportunity to save your house. They worked with you through through, through everything. And they also said that the six years would start from the last payment or the date of the or the date of the judgment. So the last payment on the account, I think, was um, since the salary deduction was continually coming in, plus the clients came in during the period of time and were still trying to make arrangements in order to save their house, they, the, the judgment basically was at the end of the day that the clients didn't have any real stake to say that to set it aside, to set the summary judgment, to set, to set the writ aside because the last, because the payments was being, but the payments was ongoing, plus the bank was working with them through the, through the entire eight years or nine years or whatever as the mortgage was going on. I mean, why it was going on. So they basically said at the end of the day that at the time basically was still or still going on from the 2020 um, writ. So 
they basically gave them until 2022 or 2024, no, 2022 this year, April 2022 to come out to, to basically to vacate, uh, to vacate the residents from 2020. And that's, I, I mean, that's basically a brief synopsis of everything from beginning to end. From yes. What I read. yes, extended to April 2022. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that's one of the, that's the case on the rights of the mortgage or. Now there's a protection for the mortgage job in the mortgagee institute court proceedings. And let's go to the case of RBC versus the Hawks. Question, question was Archer. Go ahead. So if they if they stop the salary deduction um, back in, I guess, yeah, 2012, if they actually stopped that, then it would have been passed for six years and the bank would have to like start the whole process over again. Can you explain that? Yeah, they would have. Go ahead. No, um, I'm thinking, um, Miss Miss Archer. They see the thing about a salary deduction is the salary deduction. The bank has to actually authorize the salary deduction to stop, especially if it comes in from a government institution. Mm. So, so uh, as long as the bank ha ha has that in play, and I also think there's also an order or there's also something in law where, as as long as the mortgage is on the book, they can still accept payments from you. Yes, they can. So it doesn't. So it, so it, so so it really wouldn't matter. Um, and if there was any residual balance after the sale of the house, you understand, you you still would be liable for it based on law. Mm -hmm. So so if they were if the house was two hundred and sixty four thousand, like they said, and they turn around and they sell the house and they wasn't and they advertise it and they wasn't able to get. The two hundred and sixty-four thousand. Let's say they get two hundred and sixty. Let's say they get two hundred and forty thousand. You're still responsible for the additional twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That's yeah. You understand? So, um, I don't think the bank would have actually stopped the deduction. I mean, I've known cases where Bank of Bahamas has stopped deductions on individuals after they basically said they could repossess the house or whatever the situation was. Mm -hmm. But but by law, you can still make payments on the on the account so whether they stop it or not um if they had stopped it at that point in time then basically yeah the six years you you had the six years but as long uh, based on the homeowners protection act from what i remember as long as we are in negotiation and you come to me and you say hey look i'm i can i want to do the mortgage or i want to see if i can save my house Mm -hmm. done. I can bring my family member, my daughter who is working with um, um, yeah. uh, a company. She wants to take over the mortgage. As long as you are in talks and in contact or uh, in contract or in communication with the bank to try to represent to, to save the home, you know, the bank has, the, has to give you that opportunity based on the Homeowners Protection Act before they can go, before they can actually go and say, okay, I'm selling and I can sell outright you would be the first person that ha have to, to do it. But at the end of the day, if you fail to do it, then the bank can go ahead and enforce their order um, of sale. Okay. And so, so the salary deduction is one thing, but they also came and they also made an, uh, an agreement say, okay, you all accept $250,000 and be finished. And, and Bank of Bahamas said, okay, yes, we'll do that. So all of these, and they actually put it in their affidavits also where they came in, uh, um, I guess, in 20, 2015 or 2016 with that arrangement to do that. So all of that was playing a part of it. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Who wants to do the, the halls? Lawson and Rhonda. RBC versus the halls. Because this one is about someone wanting to pay the person's mortgage. And in this case, the bank didn't comply with certain sections of the act under the Home Protection Act. Who wants to present that one? Okay, Lisa, you read that one? Camille? 
I'm sorry, no, ma'am, I didn't read it. I do apologize. Okay. I was trying to move just now from the from the oh. email to this. Sorry. All right. Camille, what about you? Did you read the halls? So in this case, the defendant said that Royal Bank of Canada read section 4.1 of the Homeowners Protection Act. And that section states under section subsection three, the obligation of a mortgagee to give notice prior to institution court, instituting court proceedings. It says under 4.1, where a mortgagee is in breach of the mortgage agreement, the mortgagee shall not institute proceedings before the court in respect of the breach, unless has been served upon the mortgagee either personally or by registered post at least 30 days prior to instituting such proceedings, a notice in writing stating A, the nature of the breach of any covenant in the mortgage. And subsection two says, the court may as it seems fit upon an ex party application by a mortgagee vary the method of service mentioned in subsection one. So in this matter, Judge Winder gave his decision. He said that the plaintiff's evidence as contained in affidavit of Neil Roll, and the plaintiff of course is RBC, said by letters dated July, 2019, the plaintiff wrote to each of the halls, notifying them one, of their breach under the mortgage, two, that they should satisfy the breach proceedings would be, if they would, did not satisfy it, proceedings would be initiated without further notice, three, they advised them of their right to apply for relief and means of contact of the plaintiff to discuss matters in compliance with the Homeowners Protection Act. The letters were served by registered posts and the registered post mail was posted on the 14th of August, 2019. The plaintiff, the RBC again, rely on the provision of the general, the IGCA, the Interpretation and General Clauses Act in support of their petition. In evidence, the, the halls in their affidavit, they filed that on the 23rd of November, 2020. And in it, they spoke of certain things, even though it was kind of vague. They said that I have not received a demand letter from the plaintiff in accordance with section four of the HPA. And I have not seen the Higgs and Johnson letter dated the 29th of July, 2019, or any demand letter at all from the plaintiffs by post. They also said in the affid that the affidavit of Ms. Roll state that I was served at my last known address. However, the affidavit, the demand letter produced and the registered post receipt all failed to condescend to quote, my last known address, but rather states to be addressed to general delivery without even specifying which post office branch general delivery the letter is intended to be delivered to. Moreover, the plaintiff, RBC, was very well aware of my last known address, Swordfish Drive, Stapleton Gardens. As evidence on the face of originating summons, commencing the substantive matter before the Supreme Court of the Bahamas. Second, then the third thing they say is that I could not be said to have received the said demand letter, when there's absolutely no address or post office box on the demand letter or on the registered post receipt, but simply addressed to Rhonda Hall, General Delivery, Nassau, Bahamas. Said that the demand letter dated July, 2019 was written by the same law firm representing the plaintiff in this matter. And I'm therefore of the belief that the plaintiff intentionally addressed the demand letter in that manner to ensure that I was not in receipt that the plaintiff, the bank has never reached out to me by way of notice in writing and served upon me either personally or by registered post prior to the institution of these proceedings with a view of entering into an agreement regarding redress of any alleged arrears inclusive of modification of the mortgage terms. So the judge went on. He said, it is true that the HPA permits service either personally or by registered post there must be a proper registered posting of the notice. There is no evidence as to how and why RBC would determine to send a letter to the halls at a general delivery box when they were well aware 
that the halls resided in premises, which are the subject of the mortgage at Swordfish Drive, Stapleton Gardens. There's no evidence as to the basis. It determined that this was the defendant's last known postal address. And more importantly, which post office location this was. In any event, on the second defendant's evidence, the plaintiff was aware of a postal address at PO Box N8249, Nassau, Bahamas. Reliance upon the Homeowners Protection Act and the IGCA is premised upon the use of a proper postal address. I find that the service purported to have been made pursuant to the act on the defendants was inadequate in result that the plaintiff did not fulfill this obligation under the Homeowners Protection Act. And I do not accept that there was a service by post on these defendants. As the defendants note, when it was time to pursue these proceedings in the Supreme Court, there was no difficulty in seeking to effect personal service on them. Their address is prominently stated on the originating summons as Swordfish Drive, Stapleton Gardens. And of course, the action was struck out and the plaintiff was free to commence fresh proceedings to comply with section 4.3 of the Homeowners Protection Act. So you see a simple mistake like that can cost the bank. Um, they did better. Sorry, Ms. Hatcher. Even, mm -hmm. even with that simple mistake though, um, I, you did say that they could go back. The only thing it actually cost them was time, right? Yes, time. Okay. Yeah, just time. So then you also have a protection for mortgagors when the mortgagee exercise non-judicial power of sale. So when a mortgagor is in breach of the mortgage agreement, section 7.2 of the act outlines the specifics that must be included in writing to the mortgagor prior to the mortgagee exercising his power of sale. The notice must be served either personally or by registered post upon the mortgagor at least 30 days prior to instituting such proceedings. And upon receiving the notice, the mortgagor or a member of his family who has been contributing, like we discussed a few minutes ago, to the payment prior to the breach may within 21, 28 days of service of the notice apply to the court for relief to postpone the sale. The power of the court to grant relief in this instance is laid out in section nine. The court may make an order to postpone the sale of the mortgage property for a reasonable period where it appears that the mortgagor is likely to A, pay any sums due under the mortgage or remedy a default consisting of a breach of any other obligation arising under or by virtue of the mortgage or pay arrears. Sections four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine do not apply to any legal proceedings existing at the coming into operation of the act. The other rights and entitlement, discharge from any and all liabilities for sums due at sale, the mortgagor's liability for any, re resident, any residual sums owing at the date of the sale of the mortgage property may be eliminated and the mortgagee's right to pursue an action for debt may be jeopardized given the provisions of section 11.8 of the act, which states that, quote, save for any surplus amounts referred to in subsection seven, the exercise by the power of sale shall discharge the mortgage or from any and all liabilities for any sums due under the mortgage if at the date of the sale, A, a sum equal to at least one half of the principal and accrued interest has been paid to the mortgage E, or B, the mortgage or has been in occupation of the dwelling house for a period not less than 50% of the original mortgage term. Two, second right, to make an offer to purchase. The mortgagor may make an offer to purchase the mortgage property at the market rate prior to the mortgagee accepting an offer to purchase the said mortgage property. Three, there's a right to request mortgage statement. The mortgagor has the right to request in writing a mortgage statement free of charge up to twice a year, and the mortgagee must respond to any such request within 30 days of receipt. If the mortgagee fails to respond without giving a reasonable excuse, any rights that it may have for the enforcement of the debt will be suspended until it has been complied with. This relates only to those proceedings initiated after 
the coming into effect of the act. There's a right to choose your attorney and appraiser and insurer for mortgage transaction. Five, there's a right to transfer mortgage loan to another lender where mortgage or exercises its entitlement under section 17 of the CLA, the CLPA, the mortgagee must assign or convey the debt to the new lender without requiring the mortgagor or the new lender to pay any costs associated therewith. Six, there's a right of written notification of transfer, assignment, or sale of mortgage loan. If a mortgagee transfers, assigns, or sells the mortgage's debt, the mortgagee must devise the mortgagor in writing not less than 30 days before the effective date of the transfer, assignment, or sale. And the notice must be served either personally or by registered post. The notice of transfer must include the effective date of the mortgage debt transfer, assignment or sale, the name and address and a contact number for both the current mortgagee and the transferee, signee or purchaser, a statement that the transfer of the mortgage debt does not adversely affect any terms or conditions of the mortgage agreement. The transferee, a signee or purchaser must not vary the rate of interest applied to the mortgage debt with the effect that it is higher than the interest rate prior to the transfer require the mortgage or to pay fees, administrative or otherwise, or charges with or arising from the purchase of the mortgage debt, or offer the mortgage or new payment terms that place the mortgage or in a worse position than he would have been had his mortgage debt not been sold. So for our next class, I want us to all be ready to discuss the last case I sent to you, which was on Junkanoo Estates. Anyone read it? Yeah, I did. Okay, well, we'll do that for next class. And I'm gonna send you some more cases for next week. Um, can I, Ms. Archer, you said you sent me the Albany case, but I haven't seen it yet. I didn't send you the link. You sure? Positive. Anyone got the Albany case? Or oh, that's one I have to look up. I think that's one I have to look up. I think something came through in the email. With, I received um, it. Okay. All right. But who didn't receive it? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You didn't receive it? But Darius, this was for you. Okay. I'll send it to you. Junkanoo one, correct? Okay. Can, I, can you send it to me too, please? Which one you need? We you talking about the Junkanoo case? That's what we're talking that's what we're we're referring to right now. No, I said the oh, um, the Albany. Albany, Albany. Oh, I don't think I, I haven't received that neither. You didn't send get out. Send that to me as well, please. I didn't get it either. Well, okay. So that's Kenneth, Darius, Devon, uh, Laurie. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So none of y'all got Albany. No, ma'am. All right. But I did send it though. Okay, so for next week, we'll do Junkunu Estate, and I'll send you some more cases. Okay. For those who so saw Junkunu Estate, I didn't get Albany either. You didn't get it either? No, okay. I didn't. I'll send Albany along with the other ones I have to look up. Alistair, Spring Castle, and Sadiq. And Parker versus Dunbar also, right? Yes. Okay, all right. I'll put all of those in one and for you all along and I'll send a separate one with the new cases for the next chapter. The Bohemian cases, I'll separate the Bohemian cases from those. Hi, Ms. Archer, which one of the Junkanoo cases you're talking about? The one um, with Yuri or it's a judgment given on the 3rd of April, 2017. Let's see which ones you have there. Junkanoo Court of Appeal, 2018.
<laughs> Duncan Ola State and Yuri and Irene and UBS. Okay, then I have a copy of that one. Okay, thanks. All right. That's the one. Okay, so start with that one next class and we move into the next. We'll do the other cases for remedies and then we move into the next chapter. Okay? You see, we, we're doing all of the John Connor ones, correct? Because I see you sent three. All, they're all of them for you to read, but we're only going to discuss the one for 2018. Okay. That's Ms. 2018. Ms. Archer, aren't the three of them, no, 2015. Aren't the three of them the same? One is just the Supreme, one is just the, the, the Privy Council, and one is the um, Court of Appeals, and I guess the next one is the Judgment um, thing. Yes. So I think the three are the same. I mean, yeah, but the, I, court you more, the Court of Appeal gives you more information in terms of the case law. Right. Okay. Okay. So it gives you a little bit more, more depth to it. Okay. So, sorry, Ms. Archer, I, I apologize. I thought one, I thought all of it was like just a continuation because where, they, where, where they, the staff, the, the defendants or whoever, um, they appeal to the court of appeal, then they go to the Privy Council. Uh, and then I think they, well, anyway, yeah. Yeah, but Privy Council. All, all of them was, all of them is basically the same case. Or, or same. it is the same matter. The same model, yeah. Right. Same going back and forth. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're not they're not different. So you could read them all, but at the end, the most of it is in the last one. And then I have uh, a blog that they wrote. Um, I'll share with you to see what they said. A couple. What they said about the Bahamas. It wasn't nice. All right, so get ready for more reading. Sorry to say, more cases. And I'll try and send those out, start to send those out tomorrow. We can start reading, okay? Thank you. All right, have a good evening. Okay. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Hey, good night.